Ladies and gentlemen, I welcome you to the ministerial roundtables that are going to happen today. Uh, these are happening in the occasion of the 25th anniversary of uh, the ITU telecommunication development sector. And this will be the first uh, of two roundtables with the theme of the ICTs for the sustainable development goals. We're going to address them as, as SDG mostly today. And there will be a second roundtable after a coffee break uh, on the digital economy. I am very pleased to introduce to you the panelists for both roundtables uh, sitting next to me, as well as the ITU elected officials. Uh, the ITU elected officials are uh, Deputy Secretary General Mr. Malcolm Johnson, uh, the Director of Telecommunications and Standard Standardization Bureau, Chai Sub Lee, Director of, of Radio Communication Bureau, and Francois Rancy. Uh, I will also be introducing the other uh, dignitaries and uh, guests and speakers as we uh, go uh, along. Uh, and the first person to introduce now is uh, Mr. Ho Lin Zhao, who is Secretary General of the ITU. Mr. Chao. Yes, sir. Good afternoon. First, I want to thank Argentina's Minister of Modernization, Senior Andres Ibarra, and the high level dignitaries of uh, our panel who are coming here to join us for these uh, roundtables. I also want to recognize the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, who is the platinum sponsor of the 25th anniversary celebrations. Thank you for your unwearing support. Our first uh, roundtable, we are focused on the theme of WTDC 2017. ICT for SDGs, then we will discuss the future of the digital economy. Both topics are interconnected. Information and communication technology now form the backbone of today's digital economy. Meanwhile, ICTs are driving substantial transformation in many development-related sectors. Acting as an accelerator for the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. The vision of the SDGs is a wide the world where everybody has equal opportunities, where no one is left behind. It's a world where everything and everyone is empowered by ICTs. Sustainable development has driven the work of ITUD for the past quarter century. ITU and ITUD will play a critical role in the successful achievement of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. But as 3.9 billion people around the world are still not connected to the internet, so let's bring the power of ICTs to all nations, all people, and all segments of our society. Let's use today's roundtable to move one step closer to achieving progress towards universal and affordable access to ICTs for sustainable development. So ladies and gentlemen, I wish you enjoy this afternoon's roundtable discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much, uh, Chairman Zhao. Um, Now I introduce uh, His Excellency, uh, Minister Andres Ibarra. He is Minister of Modernization of Argentina and will be chairing uh, this ITUD 25th Anniversary Ministerial Roundtable. Mr. Ibarra, please address the audience. Bueno, buenas tardes. Nuevamente, es muy importante para nosotros 
en la, en la Argentina tener, como les decíamos el lunes en la apertura, tener esta oportunidad de compartir con todos ustedes estas jornadas. Y por supuesto, en esa, en esa línea, quiero agradecer nuevamente al Secretario General, a Mr. Yao, y a todo el, el board de autoridades que está aquí presente, porque realmente pasaron 23 años desde, desde aquella reunión de la UIT aquí en Argentina, y realmente para nosotros tener esta nueva oportunidad es muy, pero muy valioso. Es muy valioso porque la Argentina está en un verdadero proceso de transformación enorme de todas la, de las reglas de juego, de su convivencia como país, de las reglas del juego institucionales, volviendo a ser un país en donde la ley esté por encima de todo, la institucionalidad, la juridicidad, y desde allí todas las reglas de juego de los distintos sectores de la economía, de los distintos sectores productivos. Estamos, si, si repasamos cada una de las áreas en donde el gobierno está trabajando y realizando verdaderas transformaciones, estamos en una tarea de cambio estructural y de fondo en cada una de ellas, para que el argentino nuevamente se inserte en el mundo de una manera competitiva, de una manera de mucha confiabilidad respecto de los países, respecto de los organismos internacionales. Y justamente esto para nosotros es un norte, porque el hecho de pertenecer a estos organismos, compartir estas jornadas aquí en Buenos Aires, eh, trabajar junto a la OSD, eh, junto a Naciones Unidas, eh, en todos los organismos y áreas de trabajo como lo estamos haciendo hoy, no solo en la economía, en lo que tiene que ver con gobierno abierto, en esto que son las telecomunicaciones. La verdad que para Argentina es enormemente importante, porque después de años de estar ausentes de esto y, y de en muchos casos perder el rumbo hacia donde realmente iba el mundo, esta es una gran oportunidad para nosotros como Estado y como gobierno, para nuestros empresarios, para nuestra comunidad en general. Así que quiero agradecer realmente esta, esta oportunidad. Y también marcar el rol de los organismos internacionales en ese sentido, porque la posibilidad de generar un intercambio genuino en materia de estrategias en materia de innovación, en evaluación de tecnologías, es una oportunidad realmente importante. Yo quisiera hoy, y tal vez como complemento de lo que fueron nuestras reuniones anteriores, el, el, la, la apertura que hiciéramos el día lunes y algunas charlas complementarias, simplemente referirme y entrar en algún nivel de profundidad adicional algunos de los aspectos que la Argentina está llevando adelante en esta materia. Porque efectivamente, cuando hablábamos el lunes de que buscamos la construcción de un verdadero plan estratégico digital y desde allí que la Argentina cuente con una agenda digital, estamos hablando de lo que les decía, una verdadera transformación en las reglas del juego de este sector. Y cuando hablamos de transformación, hablamos de enormes oportunidades que queremos desarrollar y generar, porque por encima de todo le queremos dar a nuestro país, a nuestros ciudadanos, a nuestra comunidad, la oportunidad de tener un país sustentado, primero en una economía en crecimiento, una economía abierta a las inversiones locales y extranjeras, con reglas del juego absolutamente claras y previsibles. Y en particular a este sector, que yo lo veo como un sector de una enorme potencialidad de crecimiento en sí mismo, pensamos que hay, pensemos y sabemos, eh, hay numerosas fuentes de estadísticas 
a través de las cuales vemos que la dinámica de este sector empuja el Producto Bruto de los países. Un 20% aproximadamente de crecimiento en un sector como este nos lleva a crecimientos del 1 al 2% en los productos brutos internos de los países. Y esto significa no solo de la dinámica propia del sector, sino la transferencia de dinámica hacia todos los sectores de la economía. Porque como decíamos en nuestra charla inicial, eh, esta es la condición necesaria para que nuestra economía crezca de manera sustentable, que nosotros generemos un plan productivo en cada una de las áreas, en cada una de las regiones de nuestro país, depende de que tengamos un esquema de comunicaciones, de telecomunicaciones, de banda ancha, de velocidad adecuado para que esto sea posible, porque por encima de todo, hoy la dinámica de los países va hacia la necesidad de que esa transformación se apoye en el conocimiento, en la creatividad, en la innovación. Y todo esto es imposible de llevar adelante si no se apoya en una necesidad de ida y vuelta con las comunicaciones y de un desarrollo estructural de fondo en su, en su sistema de comunicaciones. Es la única manera que podamos llegar a cada rincón del país con conocimiento y, 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 a, y a distancia. Esto facilita enormemente todo el trabajo de innovación, el emprendedorismo, el desarrollo de empresas pequeñas, por supuesto las empresas grandes que son las que más posibilidades y potencial tienen para lograrlo. Pero cuando queremos desarrollar una región a 1.500 kilómetros de distancia de nuestra capital, es absolutamente clave el desarrollo de esta industria. Así que van a ver en los próximos años una transformación revolucionaria de esta industria porque es la condición necesaria que tenemos para que la Argentina crezca de manera sostenida y genere un verdadero boom de inversiones, crecimiento económico y empleo. Pero les quiero decir también que esto no es un sueño o una simple visión que tenemos y sabemos perfectamente hacia dónde vamos, pero que también ese camino ha empezado a recorrerse. Y yo quiero rescatar y destacar algunos de estos hitos importantes que hemos ido llevando, llevado adelante, porque son como el crédito inicial para mostrar que el camino ya comenzó. Así es como que en una de las premisas importantes que ha planteado la, la UIT, eh, el, el concepto de espectro, la ampliación de espectro, y la, la ampliación de frecuencias es una condición y en la Argentina ya hemos dado los primeros pasos pasando de alrededor de 290 a unos 500 megas, pero por supuesto nos falta mucho para llegar a los 1.200, 1.300 megas que son la aspiración y el objetivo que plantea eh, la, la, la Unión Internacional de Telecomunicaciones. Pero vamos en ese camino sin ninguna duda y, y, y hacia él llegaremos como condición necesaria para el desarrollo hacia el que estamos yendo. Eh, hemos dictado, y el gobierno y el presidente, una serie de normativas como el DNU 267 y el decreto 1340, que van hacia la promoción de este ambiente propicio para la innovación, la integración de infraestructura y la optimización de, de servicios. Y por supuesto que la aspiración final de todo esto es lo que yo les decía los otros días, es esa convergencia a la que estamos encaminados y a la que tenemos que rodear del marco normativo adecuado. La Argentina va a tener su ley o sus leyes en materia de convergencia y que para nosotros va a ser, en una descripción eh, asociada a nuestros planes de infraestructura, como una verdadera autopista de previsibilidad. Eso es lo que tenemos que lograr, esta verdadera autopista de previsibilidad en materia normativa. Y en ese camino, ese camino estamos transitando. Y por supuesto que todo esto, ¿por qué? Porque nosotros creemos fervientemente en la necesidad de la inversión público-privada. Hace poco hemos eh, sancionado la ley de participación público-privada porque creemos en, en, la, en la necesidad de un desarrollo compartido, 
complementario y absolutamente sinérgico, que es el Estado tiene que plantear las reglas del juego y tiene que invertir, pero la inversión privada es fundamental y nosotros vamos a crear todas esas reglas de, del juego, vamos a agregar reglas del juego para que la inversión privada local y extranjera a, a nivel de gran escala y a nivel de las pymes sea una realidad. Queremos previsibilidad, queremos rentabilidad y queremos a partir de esta previsibilidad y rentabilidad una generación y una verdadera explosión de inversiones en el sector que nos lleve a potenciar el crecimiento económico de la Argentina y aumentar el empleo de este sector tan pero tan importante. En esa línea ya el Estado está haciendo lo suyo eh, a través, como les decía los otros días, del plan de la red federal de fibra óptica y por supuesto allí hay un objetivo ya de 1.300 localidades, estamos en alrededor de 300 conectadas, nos falta, pero vamos en ese camino para conectar a toda la Argentina con una banda ancha que realmente nos dé una velocidad que es lo que hoy la demanda nos está exigiendo. Y por supuesto que también estamos trabajando con el plan de escuelas rurales, con la conectividad satelital de 2.800 escuelas rurales. Y por supuesto que también con reglas del juego para que los pequeños, las pequeñas empresas y los operadores menores también tengan sus reglas y por eso lo que tiene que ver con los OMB o las OMB que son los operadores móviles virtuales, que también para nosotros tienen una importancia fundamental en términos del desarrollo del sector. Obviamente que todo esto lo vamos a complementar con la otra parte del desarrollo de las TICs y es lo que tiene que ver con la industria audio, audiovisual. La Argentina tiene un enorme talento en, en, en su gente, en sus emprendedores, y, y realmente la industria audio, audiovisual tiene que dar un salto de calidad y de cantidad muy, pero muy importante, para lo cual también nuestras reglas del juego van a permitir generar esa, ese importante crecimiento en este sector y entonces transformar a todo nuestro, a todo nuestro sector TIC en, en un sector que verdaderamente genere innovación en la Argentina y también produzca un salto, exporte y genere una especie de faro hacia la región y hacia el resto del mundo. Queremos posicionarnos de este modo, yo les dije que veía que el futuro va a encontrar a la Argentina en un rol muy importante porque sinceramente consideramos que la condición necesaria para el crecimiento que estamos buscando en nuestro país es el desarrollo de este sector, es un sector innovador, emprendedor y que nos da las condiciones y las posibilidades para que el resto de la economía y los sectores productivos en la Argentina crezcan de una manera innovadora. Les agradezco mucho, seguiremos conversando en estos días y vuelvo a insistir que para nosotros es una gran oportunidad que queremos aprovechar el hecho de que este Congreso se esté realizando en Buenos Aires. Muchísimas gracias. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much, uh, Minister Ibarra. Um, there, there is a situation, unfortunately, due to unforeseen circumstances. Uh, Mr. Ibarra has to leave us now. Uh, he will be replaced by Mr. Hector Wisi. Uh, Mr. Wisi is Argentina's ICT secretary and head of delegation here at the WTDC 2013. Thank you very much, uh, Minister Ibarra. Muchas gracias, Ministro. Ibarra. Um, now we move on to the first uh, of the ministerial roundtables. ICT for development goals is the topic here. And we will have the opportunity to attend the launch of, of the ITU book, uh, ICT-centric economic growth, innovation and job creation. And I should say that it is an honor to introduce to you Um, the people uh, responsible for this meeting and this situation here, of course, this book. Uh, the first one who I'm going to introduce is uh, Mr. Brahim Asanu, and together with him, Dr. Ahmad Sharafat 
and Dr. William Lur here next to me. Um, Mr. Brahim Asadu, Director of Telecommunications Development Bureau uh, from the ITU, of course. Uh, we invite you to um, uh, have, the, have, the, have a few words of address to us. Excellencies, ministers, partners, academia, distinguished delegates, good afternoon to all of you. I'm standing here to talk to you about the project initiative I launched two years ago. ITU D start having academia as a member of the ITU. And I found that we should, ITU D particularly, try to take profit or to use the opportunity of having academia as our member to do something. And one day, I told, I told Dr. Ahmad Sharafat, I told him, I'm going to challenge you with the academia. You need to produce something for ITUD. We need to, pull, to produce a study that I can take to the world, a study that can go back to your universities so the student can use it as a reference paper. And you become, as such, you become the link and the Bridging the, bridging the gap between ITU and academia. Here we are today with this first book entitled ICT-Centric Economic Growth, Innovation and Job Creation. You can see this is not far. I would even say it is at the center of what you're talking about today, which is ICT for development. We know today our young people are suffering for lack of job. We know today that the peace in the world is strengthened by the fact that our young people don't have job. This book, I think, is touching this very important issue for our society. So I was happy to have that Dr. Sharafat together with Dr. Lear and other people you will see in the book. I, they put together very very high level academia members to work on this group, on this, work, on, this, on, on this book, as I've been working on it now for more than one year. As I said, this is the first, the first book we are going to continue like that. I'm feeling today so happy and so proud that those very high level uh, academia members come to ITU, you have the photo, sit down together and did this work for the good of humanity and for the good for all the people, the young people, for the good of academia, again, finally, for ICT for development. So thank you very much for joining me. Jose will be talking to, you, to us about what is in the book, because I just launched the initiative, but they are the brain behind it. So it's better to leave them the floor to talk about what they know more than myself. Again, thank you very much for joining us, and um, thank you. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much, Mr. Sanu. Uh, now we move on to the presentation itself. Uh, right now, uh, we will see a short video on the content of the book. I invite you to take your eyes towards the screens. Presenting the ITU Global Study on the Impact of ICTs on the Achievement of the UN Sustainable Development Goals. The book, ICT for SDGs, ICT-Centric Economic Growth, Innovation and Job Creation, addresses the opportunities information and communication technologies offer and provides insights and direction on how to encourage and facilitate collaborative digital entrepreneurship. 
It offers practical examples to leapfrog the innovation gap to ensure sustainability and create new job opportunities. The study offers a roadmap with practical strategies for utilising advances in ICTs to foster an environment that nourishes ICT-centric innovation, economic growth and social change, consistent with the Sustainable Development Goals. Its holistic and integrated view makes the study a comprehensive resource for all stakeholders within the ICT ecosystem, including policymakers, regulators, operators, academics, funding agencies, regional and international organisations, financial institutions and citizens to encourage collective action towards sustainable development. ICT for SDGs ICT-centric economic growth, innovation and job creation. Visit www.itu.int forward slash ICT impact dash study. Excellent. Let's continue and let's move on with this presentation. Uh, I now introduce uh, Dr. Ahmad uh, Sharafad. He's from Tarbiat uh, Modares University in Tehran, Iran, and he's the chairman of the ITUD uh, study group too. Sir? Thank you very much. Uh, indeed, it gives me a great pleasure to uh, be part of the team who contributed to this book, uh, ICT-centric economic growth, innovation, and job creation. Uh, as uh, Director Sano mentioned uh, earlier, two years ago, he uh, gave me a big challenge, uh, how uh, academia could uh, participate in the works of the ITU to produce something uh, uh, which would be um, rather unprecedented. I was involved from the very beginning, and I'm very fortunate to be part of the team as the uh, chief editor of this book. Uh, I have been fortunate to uh, be associated with uh, a number of uh, colleagues in the academia, and I would like to use this opportunity to uh, personally name them and thank them for their contributions. Um, as uh, the co-editor, uh, I'm very happy to introduce to you um, Dr. William Lair, uh, sitting at the beginning of the table. Uh, he's from uh, MIT, uh, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and together we uh, edited this book and wrote the first chapter. Uh, I will go, uh, I will give you the titles of the chapter uh, after I, I uh, thank the other authors. Um, then, uh, in addition, we have uh, Professor Tim Unwin from the University of London, uh, Alex Wong from World Economic Forum, Professor Emmanuel Giovanetti from the University of Cambridge, uh, also Dr. Uh, Shailaja Fennell from the University of Cambridge, uh, Professor George Barker from London School of Economics and also Australian National University, together with uh, Professor Prasit Mung Kulkaran and uh, Dr. Supa, uh, Supavadi uh, Aramwit from uh, Chulu, Chula Lungun Kurun uh, University in uh, Bangkok, uh, Professor uh, Jean-Pierre Offret from George Mason University, Professor uh, Raoul Katz, who incidentally is uh, a son of Argentina um, from the Columbia University in New York, Professor James uh, Larson from Sunny uh, Korea, Stony Brook University. This book has uh, seven chapters. The first chapter, uh, the title of which is ICT Engines for Sustainable Development. Chapter two, ICT. ICT's Sustainability and Development, the Critical Elements. Chapter three, Digital Divide and Digital Multiplier, a Paradigm Shift through Innovation. Chapter four, the Role of Governments in ICT-based Sustainable Development. Chapter five, uh, Business Models for ICT-Centric Sustainable Development. Chapter six, job creation and sustainable development. 
And finally, chapter seven, the future of ICT-driven education for sustainable development. As you can see, these are uh, addressing many fundamental basic challenges that the world as a whole uh, is facing. And uh, we have tried to provide uh, the readers with uh, uh, how to move forward, practical uh, steps that need to be taken in order to address these fundamental and basic challenges. Uh, my time is very limited, so I'd like to finish by uh, thank uh, Director Sano, who engaged academia in a meaningful, yet unprecedented manner, and opened new opportunities for partnership uh, with ITU by the academia. Also, uh, Dr. Andrew Kim has been exceptionally helpful in this endeavor forward, and I would like to use this opportunity to thank each and every one of um, my colleagues uh, in the academia, in the ITU secretariat, and uh, uh, the ITUD who have uh, been involved with this book. I'm very proud to be part of this uh, activity, and uh, uh, I think I should stop here and see what uh, Dr. Lair has to uh, uh, say on the content of the book. Thank you very much. I introduce you to Dr. William Lehrer from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Sir. It's a real honor to be here, and um, I would also like to thank uh, uh, Professor Sharafat and um, uh, Director Sanu for being the inspiration behind this project, and um, Andrew Kim for uh, helping make sure that all of the things got along. Um, I come from academia, and what makes this project uh, um, new is the fact that all the authors were academics, and all the material that was put together in this book was written um, for this book. Um, this isn't like you know people pulling things off their shelves. And the idea was to try and get a snapshot of um, the broad sets of issues that are confronting the whole community, the whole world uh, policy community, whatever sector you're interested in, um, and now at the 25th anniversary of the ITU, because the next 25 years are going to be even more fundamental than what we've seen before. Um, if before, the, the first phase for 25 years, we could have focused on um, getting the infrastructure out there and getting people to understand what, what ICTs do and what ICTs need to do in the economy. The next 25 years are going to take more of that because there's more infrastructure we have to put out there and there's more trends and things we have to deal with. But it's, it's something that we have to deal with economy-wide. Um, ICTs are amplifiers and accelerators. They make things go a heck of a lot faster. So in, in framing policy, the connection between academics doing research and having figuring out what that means in the marketplace and what that means in policy, the window of opportunity there is much, much shorter. And so the, those parties have to work together much more closely. Um, the first chapter looks the, that I helped co-author um, looks at sort of what, what is the economic evidence of the impacts of ICTs tell us. And what that evidence says unambiguously is that ICTs have the potential to produce great growth and to be key um, drivers and energizers of all the great things that we need to do if we're going to realize the strategic development goals. If, for example, we are going to um, raise the living standards of everybody on the planet and we are not, and we do it the way we did things in the past with the use of energy, not using renewables and things like that, it's going to be a disaster. And ICTs have to be part of that solution in places where they haven't been before. So they have to be part of leapfrogging strategies and bringing people forward. Um, but ICTs by themselves aren't enough, and ICTs can also do bad things. They can, they can accelerate um, uh, income uh, in inequities. They can, they can lead to things like winner-take-all economy, and, and policymakers need to intervene to try and uh, um, uh, oppose that. If we're going to basically have good ICT policy, we have to be, have everybody involved, and we're going to have to have holistic economy-wide engagement. It doesn't matter if you're in a sector that's adopting ICTs rapidly or you're in um, a, a market that um, is not, because wherever you are, you will be affected by this. And if you don't deal with this in a positive way and try and address this head on, um, you'll be a victim. You'll be roadkill on, on, on the next 25 years development here. Uh, one of the key things, and I think one of the key roles of the ITU is, is helping stimulate the international collaboration that's going to be absolutely essential if 
as a planet, we're going to grow forward. And when we talk about dealing with uh, the, the various policy and issues that are covered in this book, and the academic scholars in this book come from a range of different academic disciplines, it's going to have to be a multidisciplinary engagement. It's going to have to involve people across academia, across industry, across all the various industry departments, across every sector from agriculture to healthcare to government to educational sector. We have to basically build a framework that is going to be digital economy friendly um, for business and, and the legal frameworks that will make that work on a national and a global level and deal with the in within market um, disruptions that are going to uh, occur there. We need to recognize the fact that in, in, in the ICT world, as we accelerate things, skills are not static. We have to change the way we think about skills development. We have to basically understand we need to move towards things like lifetime learning and um, you know, deal with the disruptions when you know, uh, jobs that uh, for the old economy are replaced by the new economy. What do we do with those people? How do we bring them along? How do we migrate them to, um, to be part of the growth that the ICTs can help deliver? That's a key challenge. And we have to deal with the sort of global coordination. Uh, international trade is going to be a huge issue um, at every level. The, the question of how we're going to deal with things like tax revenues, um, how we're going to deal with uh, labor mobility across um, uh, sovereign boundaries and productive activities being reorganized and shifted across sovereign activities. All of these things are going to be key issues. And um, it's a real pleasure to be um, here today with this book, which is a start. And what we hope is it's a start of a collaboration and continued research for the next 25 years. So with that, let me... Thank you very much, Dr. Lerr. Thank you very much. Uh, you can obtain this book right away. You can download it for free as a PDF. Uh, if you need some help with us, let us know. Uh, but this book is available to you as of right now. Uh, so go ahead, get it. Um, we move on. Uh, right now, it's my turn to introduce Mr. Andrus Ansip, who is Vice President of the European Commission. He will address us. Mr. Ansip. Thank you. <laughs> Honorable ministers, uh, Secretary General, uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for the opportunity to speak here today at the 25th uh, anniversary of the ITU development sector. For me, as Vice President of the European Commission responsible for uh, digital uh, single market, uh, one subject close to my heart is uh, how we can use technology to improve people's lives. In my home country, Estonia, it took a great deal of political determination to achieve full digital interaction between people and governments. Today, Estonians hardly ever need uh, to go in person to any public administration office. The government only needs to ask for personal data once. Just using digital signatures save Estonia one working week a year, uh, which is equal to 2% of uh, GDP, and which is equal to defense expenditures in Estonia, for example. Our initiatives to build a digital single market uh, are not only relevant uh, to the European Union. They apply throughout the world because digital does not recognize country borders. I hope that our work can inspire other countries and regions. When it comes to development assistance, the EU and its member states cont contribute 52% of the world's official development aid. The funds managed by the EU institutions alone amount to 32 billion euros over five years. Digitization helps to leapfrog development stages, cutting directly through the newest and best technologies and services. E-government 
tools already save billions just by interconnecting public registers and eliminating irregularities. That goes for developing countries as much as for developed ones. Or take e-agriculture, which can increase the income of small farmers by up to 20%. Mobile payment systems have opened up possibilities for financial inclusion as never before. But the picture is not entirely rosy. Half the world's population remains offline, and most of them are in developing countries. A major reason for this is cost and affordability, expressed in terms of people's local income. This is where development policy can make a real difference on the ground. In May, the European Commission published a strategy to mainstream digital technologies and services into all our development cooperation activities. It has four main priorities. Ensuring access to affordable, secure broadband and to digital infrastructure. Promoting digital literacy and skills. Supporting entrepreneurs and digital innovation, promoting the use of digital technologies and services across sectors to increase accountability, transparency and governance. It will also help to empower women. Our policy will assist the management of vital resources like water, food and energy. This will mean more effective public services, such as health and education, and the use of civil registers based on EID to provide identification for everyone. Africa is our immediate priority. I can tell you today that uh, the European Union, the African Union Commission, and uh, the International Telecommunication Union are close to signing a new project where uh, the ITU's vast experience will support partner countries in Africa to better manage uh, their spectrum and achieve a higher quality and affordability of uh, mobile broadband. We also want to use uh, the EU Africa Summit uh, in Abidjan at the end of uh, November to agree with our partner countries on a common way forward. Next year, the community of uh, Latin American and Caribbean States Summit, CELAC Summit, will provide us uh, with more opportunities to engage with Latin America and boost uh, the digital economy in both our continents. I look forward to working together with all of you to achieve our common aim, to put digital properly into development. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Ansip. Thank you very much for your words and um, valuable discussion uh, so far. It is uh, nine, now time to uh, start the interactive part of our session today. Um, I will, well, first try and coordinate and help uh, all the dignitaries here, ministers, deputy ministers, C-level representatives, representatives of other organizations if uh, time permits. Um, we're looking for the biggest and most diverse views we can possibly have today in the event. By the way, I invite all ministers uh, to take the front seats now. Uh, if you're at the back, I invite you to take the front. The, there will be guiding questions, there will be uh, principles, ideas uh, that will take us through today's uh, discussion. Uh, firstly is, can you provide examples of technologies, projects and initiatives 
that, the, that have the greatest impact towards achieving the sustainable development uh, goals in your country. Uh, what challenges do you face in implementing these SDGs and how do you see ICTs making a difference? Taking, a, taking into account the 25 years of achievements of ITUD, in your opinion, how can the enabling role of ICTs for SDGs be strengthened through global efforts at regional and international level? Remember, please remember, that my role is to maintain interaction quick and moving forward. Um, I kindly ask you to use not more than three minutes when addressing uh, these issues. Uh, of course, please understand that if I have to interrupt you, it is because we want to keep discussion as diverse as possible. Remember that you can raise your flag uh, or just put it vertical uh, if you want us to go to you. Um, at this point, I invite ministers uh, to start addressing us. In first place, uh, we have uh, Bangladesh, who is going to address us now. Uh, Mr. Chairman and honorable speakers, uh, distinguished delegates, uh, we all know that uh, telecommunication and ICT are key enablers in achieving SDGs. Telecommunication and ICT directly impacts SDG goals 1, 2, 3, 4, uh, 5, 8, 9, 10, and other goals in various degrees, which involves ending hunger, poverty, promote well-being, inclusive and quality education, empowering women and girls, sustainable economic growth, reduce inequality, etc. So uh, keeping all these in mind, the government of Bangladesh has prioritized the issue of building robust infrastructure, connecting the unconnected ones to uh, promote e-governance, e-learning, e-health, agriculture, e-commerce, reducing the digital divide, banking for the unbanked population, IT literacy training, accessible and affordable internet, ICT industry development, skill development, engagement of women in digital economy, encourage innovation initi initiatives, and development of entrepreneurship amongst women. So if we go for a few uh, very, uh, uh, I would say effective initiatives that Bangladesh has taken, I would name uh, Union Digital Centers, which has so far provided uh, 116 services and 6 million population of rural areas have taken the advantage of these services, amongst whom 2.5 million are women. Post E centers have created 17,000 women and uh, 17,000 total entrepreneurs, amongst whom 8,500 are women. And a government has created an e commerce platform called Joita, which helps the uh, rural women to uh, uh, market their uh, products, uh, which we have created using the Social Innovation Fund. Uh, e healthcare services. Uh, Shono Kishori platform has been created by using mobile phone and laptop only regarding the adolescent's healthcare education. We have created teachers portal. Uh, around 95,500 teachers are well connected. They share their problems, solve their problems online. It's a very popular social media amongst the teachers. And we have national web portal, which is a gateway to 43,000 plus uh, government services and around 2,307, uh, 2,000, uh, sorry, uh, 3,000. Uh, 327,000, uh, let me reiterate, 327 million services has already been provided. I'm confusing with, confusing with numbers though. So one question that I have, I, I, it was in my mind since long, that according to the SDGs, uh, if we look at SDG goal, uh, Four, ensure inclusive and equitable quality education and promote lifelong earning opportunities for all. I would like to emphasize lifelong and for all because it does not specify or, uh, any specific age. 
Goal five, achieve gender equality and empower all women and girls. All means all women, irrespective of age. I'm raising this issue because we, we all know that in countries, uh, life expectancy is increasing. And in Bangladesh, life expectancy has increased to 74. And most of them are female. So what are we actually looking at in future, how to address this problem? As we know that uh, affordable and accessible internet is a precondition for achieving the SDGs and using ICT for SDGs and also involving women and elderly population. If we look at goal three, ensure healthy lives and promote well-being for all, at all ages, I would like uh, to em give emphasis that for all ages, if we want to ensure health uh, care uh, access, how do they really access the health care if, if they don't have the basic skill uh, to know how to access the services already provided to them? So this is actually not a statement. I would like to uh, have the input of the honorable panelists present uh, uh, on the podium that how can we collaborate and work in this issue. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Uh... Bangladesh representative, thank you very much. I would like to know if someone uh, in the panel uh, next to me uh, would have some comments to add, some questions to reply, something to say. Uh, yeah, please go ahead. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Moderator. I think that the Minister of Bangladesh are part of the answer because the Minister of Bangladesh was one of the pioneers with the ITU development sector when we initiated for the first time the meeting between ministers of ICTs and ministers of education in the headquarters of UNESCO. Uh, you said it very well. You talked about collaboration. Uh, I think that this is where the issue is. Of course, you have the in-job training, you can raise awareness, but at the end of the day, education is part of the education sector, and we should be collaborating more and more with those sectors so they can use ICT as a tool. Because so far, what I'm seeing is that I have the impression that we are talking to ourselves. We, I try to, to sketch it by saying that sometimes we are trying to sell medicines to people who don't know they are sick. So we need to do more, to be more proactive in talking to other sectors. They are our new clients. We should be talking to them, collaborating with them in the way that they can fully use the potential of ICTs for development on all those SDGs. This is what I would like to contribute at this point in time. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Sanu. Dr. Sharafat. Yes, uh, I would like to also uh, reply to the very important question that Her uh, Excellency, the Minister from Bangladesh, raised already. Um, for your information, in ITUD, uh, we have two study groups. Uh, in study group two, where I had the honor to chair the uh, study group, one of the questions that in the previous study cycle we studied was on e-health. And in that, uh, uh, in that question, uh, we were uh, uh, working on new platforms, new applications that uh, specifically address the problem that you mentioned. Now, the question, of course, uh, needs to be uh, evolved and uh, amended as we have progressed. In uh, Committee 3 and Committee 4 in this very WTDC, uh, we would be formulating new questions, part of which would be on e-health. And uh, I would encourage uh, all uh, countries, including uh, colleagues uh, from Bangladesh, to participate in the works of the study groups uh, that would be focusing on many issues, including the health that was one of the 
what that was part of the question that uh, uh, Honorable Minister from Bangladesh raised. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sharafat. Our next uh, intervention is by the Russian Federation. Спасибо, господин председатель. Я бы хотел чуть-чуть истории. Одни из первых целей устойчивого развития были сформулированы в 86 году, и они назывались «Будущее, которое мы хотим увидеть». The future we want. И если взять все предыдущие революции, которые так или иначе влияли на человечество, они все сопровождались какими-то побочными эффектами, которые не факт, что давали положить, были положительными. Что касается наших целей 17, я бы хотел сказать, что мы как ответственная организация при ООН должны конкретно понимать все последствия тех решений, которые мы здесь можем принять и принимаем. Так получилось, что вот эта новая революция, четвертая, она связана прежде всего с ИКТ, то есть с той организацией, с теми министерствами, индустрией, которые мы все здесь, которые мы здесь представляем. Что касается нашей страны, то можно сказать, что вообще цифровизация и новая революция, она начала происходить уже давно, и есть много признаков вот того, что наступит завтра, которые мы можем уже сейчас уже видеть. Самые большие вызовы для России – это наша территория и то, что плотность населения не везде одинакова. Если говорить о конкретном проекте, для нас самый последний проект и самый эффективный проект, который мы имели в последние годы, это проект по прокладке и ШПД во все населенные пункты Российской Федерации. Это дало исключительный эффект, который мы сейчас вот наблюдаем. Это видно и потому, что какое количество граждан начали использовать электронные сервисы. Мы видим, что во многих населенных пунктах, там, где есть интернет, появился уже возможности для удаленного медицинского обслуживания. Мы проложили почти 230 тысяч километров оптоволокна. Этого достаточно для того, чтобы пять раз обернуть землю по экватору. И это был самый большой проект для нас в последние годы. И я говорю о том, что инфраструктура – это очень важный элемент для того, чтобы встретить все вызовы, которые будут со всеми. Я полагаю, что очень большим, если говорить про ITU, для нас большим событием был всемирная встреча на высшем уровне по информационному обществу. Многие цели, которые мы тогда сформулировали, они прямо коррелируются с теми целями, которые есть ООН, целями устойчивого развития. И в этой связи еще раз хочу подчеркнуть, что у нас очень большая ответственность для того, чтобы вот побочные эффекты любой революции, которые до этого происходили у человечества, не случились в нашем случае. Спасибо. Do we have representatives from the panel uh, with a devolution for Russia? Something to add? We go on to our next intervention by the representative of Benin. Uh, please go ahead. Oh. 
We're having a technical problem. Do we have a mic available? Oh, there we go. Okay. Allô, allô, ok, c'est bon, merci. Uh, c'est le Bénin. Uh, je voudrais souligner uh, les hostilités de, de l'écosystème. Uh, le, le livre a mis en évidence tout l'écosystème, tout l'écosystème qui caractérise les, les, les TIC et a fait le lien entre les TIC et le développement humain durable. Mais dans nos pays, les défis, les défis majeurs, c'est de pouvoir intégrer tous les TIC dans les documents de politique nationaux. Parce que pendant un, moment, pendant un long moment, les TIC sont à part les documents considérés comme les affaires des partenaires au développement et les documents de politique nationaux aussi vont, sont à part. Alors, le défi majeur aujourd'hui, c'est de pouvoir concilier les développements, les, 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 les outils de développement nationaux avec les TIC, les TIC pour pouvoir pour servir aux atteintes des objectifs et pouvoir mettre en place un cadre de suivi tant au niveau national qu'au niveau régional. Merci. Thank you very much. I invite uh, all other ministers to please, please raise your placard, show your flag, raise your hand. Uh, let me know that you want to address uh, the rest of the dignitaries and, uh, and, and of course, the, the experts. Uh, yeah, please, doctor. Uh, I want to thank uh, the distinguished delegate from Benin uh, for uh, this very important question. I'd like to use this opportunity and refer you to chapters one and four uh, of this book. In chapter one, of course, we uh, uh, consider the ecosystem and in chapter four, uh, the role of governments in ICT-based sustainable development. That's a uh, uh, subject uh, treated uh, with enough detail, and I would like to uh, again inform you of uh, uh, the fact that this question is already um, uh, addressed in this book. Thank you. Mr. Chow. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I would like to add some information. I visited the Penang in March of this year. I was honored to be received by Excellency, the head of state, the president. And then I also uh, honored to be received by the president of the parliament. And that is the country where I also have another honor during my short visit of two days to have a meeting with several ministers in the same room. Uh, what happened there is uh, they're talking about uh, e-strategy and they realize that uh, today uh, the system, the infrastructure may not be that kind of uh, based to use ICT to transform the country. While uh, the infrastructure is uh, basically uh, invested and uh, developed by our operators, they have several operators in that country like many other countries. While uh, the government realize that ICT can help uh, agriculture, can help uh, science, uh, technology, research, can help uh, public health. Uh, they would like to have a national uh, e-strategy to develop. While uh, the president of uh, parliament uh, told me that uh, he now has uh, uh, a task to uh, ask parliament to approve uh, some laws submitted by one min ministry and then other day by another ministry, that uh, seemed to be uh, not very much, uh, very much uh, coordinated. So they'd like to see a uh, consolidated way to see how can we develop uh, the national EU strategy to guide the next uh, step of uh, development. Then I, I presented to the President uh, of State and the President of Parliament that uh, a little bit earlier I visited uh, Slovenia. I met with uh, Deputy Prime Minister of Slovenia and he gave me uh, more or less a similar information that uh, today you know, really the government have put uh, E national strategy uh, as a priorities to look at uh, the, the whole picture so that uh, you can make the best uh, uh, strategy to guide the ICT development to facilitate social economic development rather than to let each ministry to develop their own strategy. So that one, you know, that uh, 
the Deputy Prime Minister of Slovenia wished to share that views with the colleagues. I'm very pleased that he is with us today. And this kind of thing is relatively new to, to us. And I got similar comments from the Minister of Uganda during our WISIS forum process in Geneva. And he came to me that uh, uh, today he thinks that the individual project is important, but it's not that urgent. And he likes to have uh, ideal advice to see how can we develop a national ICT strategy to address our, our, our issues. And this strategy will guide the investment for ICT infrastructures based on the national ICT industry. I think that those kind of things are something uh, much, uh, in my opinion, uh, much uh, uh, wider and also have a profound uh, uh, influence to the future development of ICT. So those uh, issues, uh, I think that uh, this uh, book gives us a lot of uh, guidance, but that uh, uh, question raised by the authorities to me in March seems to be some uh, new challenges to us, and we have to also to have some kind of uh, studies. By the way, when I was there, I was also invited to visit uh, one of the big uh, universities. That university has uh, 8,000 students. But I was uh, somehow a little bit uh, surprised that uh, over the last decade, there are few girl students to study the engineers, engineering, mathematics. And for mathematics, for example, almost uh, one decade, there's no girl students for mathematics. So that also worries us a little bit. So to address the gender balance, to address this kind of uh, equal uh, opportunities for women and girls, uh, with boys, uh, I think that we have to, to, to also to, to to be of aware that the challenges. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Secretary General. Your Excellency, Mr. Kovdipnikar. Yes, uh, thank you, and uh, thank you, Sec Secretary General, for these uh, kind words. But what we learned in, in Slovenia regarding to your question is that there is more or less, when we talk about the uh, services, technology, knowledge, it's the question of the chicken and the egg. So you have to find a way how you, in constant cooperation, develop all those things together. Because if you build infrastructure and there is not services to use it, it will not be recognized. If you have services without infrastructure, if you have services and infrastructure without knowledge, again, it's not okay. If you have services which are not connected in behind between the different governmental resources, again, they will not be effective. So for us, the most common or the most important way to approach to the national strategy is to establish constant national cooperation. And widely, I'm strongly convinced that we have to uh, deliver not only national, but strong, constant international cooperation that we can synchronize our systems. Then our services and our infrastructure will have much bigger impact on quality of life and uh, business opportunities. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Lehr, you please go ahead. I, I lend you my yeah. mic. <laughs> Thank you. So, so I, I really like this discussion, and I would like to applaud all of the folks that have spoken about this. Um, one, for example, one example that people have talked a lot about is the use of creating digital platforms. And digital platforms can expand inclusion by allowing people um, to work more flexibly and um, you know, in, in schedules that work for them. The um, potential downside of that is that um, labor laws that are designed to create society, you know, uh, safety nets don't necessarily cover them. And then you end up these disruptions where you have digital workers being treated differently from other workers. And you know, these things happen across the different sectors. When we, you know, when it was just something that existed in the digital world, um, then just the people that were worried about that could worry about it. But now with things like Airbnb and Uber and the sharing economy, um, it affects all these other sectors. And so the idea that you would have um, national coordinated policies that would go across all these different sectors and then also international coordination just seems absolutely essential. And, you know, and I think the ITU uh, is, is um, one of the key players in this space going forward. Thank you very much, Dr. Lear. Of course, uh, this, is, this is the main point, international coordination. That's what we're trying to do here. And I invite now to uh, the minister from Mali to share his view, please. Merci. 
je suis le ministre de l'économie numérique et de la communication du Mali. Ma, ma question va être très simple. Je sais que nos États ont souscrit tous depuis 2015 à ces objectifs de développement durable. Dans mon propos de la dernière fois, ce qui nous importe ou nous au Mali, c'est l'objectif numéro 9, c'est-à-dire comment réduire cette fracture numérique. Alors, ma question est adressée surtout à nos partenaires de l'UIT. Quelles sont les nouvelles initiatives qu'ils encourageraient pour que nous autres pays en voie de développement, nous puissions aller vers cette réduction de la fracture numérique qui se fait de plus en plus sentir dans nos économies. Je vous remercie. Thank you very much, Minister, Minister of the Economy, and of course our sector. Very interesting. Uh, do we have contributions from the panel? Do we have contributions from, from the rest of the floor, of course? Do we have elements? No? Okay, please go ahead. Thank you. Of course, everybody knows that uh, no simple answers on, on this question. But uh, I would like to return to this uh, very first uh, topic also, uh, dealing with uh, uh, health care and, uh, and connectivity issues. I think uh, with, uh, through uh, uh, digital public services, we, we can create some co somehow public demand and if uh, people, they would like to get to those services, uh, then uh, there is a reason for uh, telecom operators, for example, to make those investments. And I don't think it's a, it's the right way to say that at first we have to cover all the country or all the continent with a, uh, good networks, and, and then we have to educate our people, and then we will start to provide those services. Uh, for me, uh, those services, uh, they are even um, the most important part in, the, in this process. In some cases, uh, it's possible to buy, provide, for example, uh, really good uh, healthcare services uh, uh, in the way that people, they are not able to understand, uh, is it digital or not? Let's take uh, e-prescriptions, for example. So, um, it means uh, people, uh, they have to have identification uh, cards or uh, digital identities. And uh, on basis of those identities, uh, uh, when uh, there is in the country e-prescription system, uh, those people, they will get uh, their pharmaceuticals from every drugstore. And in cases of chronic diagnosis, uh, they don't have to visit uh, their general practitioner. Uh, all the, uh, in all those cases, uh, they can just call and uh, they will get uh, the, those pharmaceuticals uh, from every drugstore. So, those people, they don't know about this, how the system works. They will ask, how did you call my son this system? Ah. Oh, e-prescription. This is uh, e-healthcare. I like it. I want to get it. And I would like to say in many EU member states that uh, people, they are extremely happy because of those uh, uh, e-prescriptions. But we created another problem. So in Finland, 100% of medical doctors are issuing e-prescriptions in Sweden, in Estonia, in Denmark, in Greece. But when people, Swedish people, for example, will travel to Finland, paper is still needed. So the, those prescriptions, they are not able to cross borders in, in digital um, and trusted manner uh, on the 21st century. So we, we have to go on with the, this process where we have to enlarge the whole system uh, um, across the world, I would like to say. So, I would like to say that governments, they can create through providing uh, digital public services, people's demands, and if people will say that I like this system, then politicians, so they have to invest much more and into digital, and it means also that um, uh, we, this digital divide will be 
not so big uh, problem anymore. So uh, the fact that uh, people, they are not uh, uh, enough uh, educated for those digital pub public servi services uh, does not mean that uh, it, it can be like an excuse for governments uh, not to provide those uh, digital public services. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Please go on. Uh, oui, pour répondre à la, la question du Mali, quelles initiatives peuvent être prises pour réduire uh, la fracture numérique uh, Je crois qu'il y en a un certain nombre qui ont déjà été prises uh, dans le cadre de l'UIT pour réduire uh, la fracture sous deux de ses aspects. Le premier, c'est l'aspect géographique, comment connecter les régions qui ne sont pas aujourd'hui connectées à Internet. La deuxième, c'est comment le faire d'une façon euh, qui soit financièrement accessible pour ceux qui seront effectivement couverts. Alors, ces deux aspects euh, sont en, fait, en, en, en réalité euh, militent dans le sens de rendre disponible des bandes de fréquence qui permettent une meilleure couverture, et donc une couverture à moindre prix, euh, et euh, les bandes qui ont été identifiées depuis euh, 2007 par l'UIT pour, pour cela sont les bandes euh, en dessous de 800 MHz, donc les bandes que l'on appelle les bandes du dividende numérique. Euh, et donc l'UIT a, a essayé de rendre ces bandes disponibles de plusieurs façons. La première façon, c'est de les identifier dans les conférences mondiales des radiocommunications de l'UIT, ce qui a été fait. La deuxième, c'est d'accompagner euh, les États membres pour accélérer la transition à la télévision numérique et donc libérer ces, ces bandes de fréquences qui sont aujourd'hui utilisées par la télévision analogique dans beaucoup de pays encore. Et la troisième, c'est euh, l'initiative de coordonner euh, les États membres au niveau de l'utilisation des fréquences pour rendre ces demandes utilisable sans brouillage. Donc c'est un travail qui a été fait pour les pays africains et pour les pays euh, du groupe arabe depuis deux ans et nous conduisons euh, cet effort aujourd'hui pour les pays d'Amérique centrale et des Caraïbes. Donc voilà ce que je peux dire pour les initiatives qui ont été prises. Merci. Mr. NC, thank you very much. Uh, we now move on to Iran. Representative Minister from Iran, please. Make sure your light is red. Red light, the other button. No? Oh, there, there we go. Almost yeah, there. Okay. Thank you, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the Islamic Republic of Iran, I would like to con con congratulate the 25th anniversary of I ITUD. Uh, we all believe in the importance of digital inclusion concept as devised in the objectives of ITU. The digital inclusion for communities means access, adoption, and application of ICT for better life and provision of equal opportunities for all. By new opportunities, which is brought in uh, through advances in big data analysis, a new dimension in appearing is appearing, nam namely the power of predicting the future. And I think this is the basic point that brings ICT into real life for the benefit of people. New technologies like 5G, IoT, cloud computing, intelligent, artificial intelligence, and so on, are, uh, com are paving the way for such an extra extraordinary of power, power of predicting the future. This power, of course, can be used for, as a tool for better life for everyone, and at the same time can be misused to 
increase the digital gap between communities and countries. Uh, it is a real, really important fact that, that if countries in the world do not have the knowledge, infrastructure, human resources, and competency for using such a power, the digital gap will, will be increased uh, exponentially, and the situation, situation would be worse for uh, less uh, for countries who have less access to such a power. Uh, I, sis I sincerely hope that ITU can help the world to equally gain access to the technology, knowledge, and human and institutional capacity for a balanced access to uh, such a potency. I would like to have the comments of gentlemen that what could be probably the program of ITU to help countries that have less access to such power in order to get the potency which is actually necessary for keeping them on way and uh, helping them to be part of the international community as much as possible and as fruitful as possible. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Minister. Mr. Chow. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'd like to add a few uh, comments here. Uh, we noted that uh, in our opening remarks uh, uh, from our Secretary General of the United Nations, we recognize that the ICT is the enabler for each and every SDGs. So that is a very, very good uh, encouragement to us. And the ICT, uh, you know, that uh, is uh, very much uh, uh, progressed uh, everywhere. That, uh, you know, we are very proud of uh, achievement. But here we do have uh, challenges. That we're talking about the 3.9 billion people not connected yet. Uh, if we have to connect to them, we have to go there to connect to them. We have to extend our infrastructure there. We have to provide a good ICT tools to connect to them. And we need an investment. And where is the investment? IET talked about the Connect 2020 project. And to have uh, next 1.5 billion people online by 2020, Someone calculated we need a $450 billion. And we went to World Bank to ask if they can help us. They said, told us that they don't have money because they have their own project. They have their own <laughs> uh, priorities. But uh, when we talked to our industry, the industry told us that $450 billion to connect the next 1.5 billion people. You are joking. You need more. So we have a dilemma here. And uh, uh, here, of course, you know, that uh, people all talk about uh, public-private uh, partnership. I think absolutely it's correct. We, we have to encourage public-private partnership. And we also have to encourage our authorities, government, to help to create a good environment to attract the investment. Because you cannot uh, force the private sector to invest to the places that do not see anything profitable. Now, there is another problem. There is a general perception that the ICT is the business making process, it's profitable, serves the examples. Therefore, you don't need to worry too much about ICT development. So in any country, you have your financial ministers, they can give money to any other ministries, may not give money to you, to our telecom ministry. Why you need investment for, 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 for connected people? So this is uh, somehow a, a dilemma for us, and uh, I, I am also very pleased to know that uh, many partners wish to cooperate with our developing countries to do the business. For example, we just heard from uh, Mr. Ansip, our leader of the European Union, that uh, they put uh, Africa as a priority. I also noted that, uh, you know, for example, Japanese uh, uh, Prime Minister Abe went to, to uh, Kenya to talk about uh, their project. Uh, and then the Chinese president went to Johannesburg to talk about the cooperation with Africa. And we have also India Prime Minister talk a lot about the cooperation between India and Africa. So we have a lot of uh, uh, partners willing to come to, to help, uh, for example, our Africa. Now, if everybody come to Africa with their own project, with their own ideas, those things may not be really to the best interest of our African members. Uh, African members may see some problems, the uh, conflicting of the uh, project, 
overlapping some kind of uh, some investment. So in my opinion that uh, you know, our members should also look for opportunities to come up with our own priorities, own project, then present this to our partners to look for partnership. And from ITU, we also try to uh, go to the other uh, so-called ecosystem. So I myself went to visit uh, FAO to try to look at the cooperation between ITU and uh, FAO for IE architecture. And actually, in fact, the 18th of September, we signed an agreement in New York to increase our cooperation. And next week, uh, we will have uh, Director General of WHO come to our conference to talk about uh, cooperation with the ITU members to develop uh, e-health and to modernize the e-health, uh, the public health systems. And all these kind of efforts, I think, that will give us the opportunity to see more and more chance to have the new initiative, the new projects. But in the end, I think that the still, it's our members who really have to come up with our own guidance, own ideas, own visions for our own development and put our own priorities on the table for discussion with, uh, with partners. So that is uh, what I'd like to, to add. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chow. Uh, we now go to the representative of Samoa Minister. It will go red. It, it, yeah, just let it rest. It will go red immediately. There we go. Thank you. I'll be very brief. It's a request to uh, ITU. Uh, biggest challenge in our side of the world is capacity in terms of building applications that will make life easier in, in, uh, in the country. I'm hearing around the room, and I heard uh, a few friends yesterday talking about their countries already developing app, uh, applications in areas of agriculture, in connectivity, in terms of uh, schools, in teachers, uh, communications. Um, these are the challenges that we're facing. And not only that we are not able to produce these ourselves or uh, start deriving these ourselves, but also financially, we're not able to. I wonder if ITU can, uh, can take an inventory of the ITU members who all have already developed uh, these applications, like mobile applications, and if these can be shared amongst uh, countries, member countries. Some of these applications I'm hearing uh, ITU have been involved in terms of uh, funding and developing them. If you have developed some in the continent of Africa, I wonder if you can uh, bring it to our side of the world and share with us, instead of us reinventing the wheel, but share, you know, you know free of cost as a matter of uh, uh, cooperation and uh, working collaboratively and that to me is strengthening um, and bringing the ICT for SDGs uh, to the regional international levels. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Let Sunil? me just uh, give uh, general comments then uh, my colleague uh, Brahima will uh, uh, provide his advices. I think that it's a particular request uh, it could be uh, something for us to do very quickly, that uh, if we you not uh, find the answer from us. Uh, I think we do have some information in this respect, but we have not uh, consolidated those information. And uh, your uh, suggestion to have uh, good experiences uh, when we worked with the other continent to, pre to extend that kind of uh, benefit to Asia-Pacific regions, I think that is also reasonable expectation or request, and we, we should certainly will do that. I uh, just uh, like to add uh, one more information that uh, well, during my previous intervention, I talked about the uh, possibility to have uh, suggestions, uh, proposals uh, from our members, and this is one of them. And another important uh, project uh, I see uh, from Africa is the Smart Africa. And Smart Africa is an absolutely marvelous project. I appreciate that very much. So such kind of request, such kind of uh, uh, presentations from our members, I think that uh, will give us opportunities to look for a uh, good uh, partnership uh, with us. IT would like to work with you and would like to, 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 to go together with you. So uh, having said that, let me just uh, ask uh, Rahima if uh, you could add your advice. Thank you very much, Honorable Minister. Not well taken. We have resources. Personally, I took the initiative uh, four years back to put in place a brainstorming group 
of diverse um, background and uh, around the initiative we call Empowering Development. And the first thing we did was to make a stock taking of all the application existing. So this document exists, can be shared, and you could take, uh, let's say, uh, start from there. But I also understand that we need to do something, not just well taken, to do more than that and find a way to share, to go and share with the Pacific Islands, not so well taken, and all the, all the region of the world as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Sanu. Mr. Koplivnikar. Thank you. Just shortly on what you asked, uh, this is something what we are also very keen about, sharing the application, sharing the knowledge. But we have uh, a problem. If uh, some software solution for the government, education or something like this is developed in one country, probably it will not just function in other. You have to adopt it. So there is the question of compatibility, maintaining and data supplying. This is why it is so important uh, inside the country and also wider that you synchronize the platforms and we start to exchange part of applications. If we agree on what kind of a data sets we all use and what kind of a communication means we all use, then sharing the software solution is possible. Otherwise, it's very problematic because it's not only software that you take, download from our app store, plug and play. You have to support it, maintain it, feed with data, and this is more complicated. Thank you. When talking about uh, app industries, then we have to understand that uh, this is a rapidly developing area. And uh, not only in the United States of America or, or in the European Union, but in the European Union, uh, the volume of uh, app industry was in the year uh, 2014 uh, 17 billion years and according to prognosis it will be uh, 63 billion years in the year uh, 2018. And when talking about jobs, then 2014, 1.8 million jobs just in app industry in the European Union and according to prognosis that there will be 4.8 million jobs in app industry in the European Union. I was in Nigeria and uh, we had some meetings also with uh, local startups. For example, uh, one really smart guy created uh, an app uh, allowing uh, to order natural gas just in time, in right place. The same type of uh, solutions are like, uh, like people, uh, they know uh, about Uber or Taxify or how to get food at home and, and so on. I don't think it's a, uh, somebody in, the, in Europe will create uh, that kind of apps. It's, it's possible only there where there is a real demand for that kind of uh, apps. I think, uh, once again, all the governments, uh, they have to support uh, uh, those uh, really creative people and uh, maybe one day they will provide something for, uh, for the whole world. In Africa, M-Pesa was uh, created and uh, now uh, this mobile payment system is used also in some uh, European countries. So. Uh, of course, we have to cooperate, uh, we have to share uh, uh, experience, uh, but uh, at first, uh, all the countries, uh, all the governments, uh, they have to support creative people inside of, of those countries. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Ansip. Thank you very much, Mr. Koplivnikar. Uh, following your point, uh, Minister from Samoa, following your points, uh, I would like to bring into this discussion someone else from the UN, the representative of the UN High, high of uh, sorry, UN Office of the High Representative for the Least Develop de de Developed Countries, Landlocked Developing Countries, and Small Island Developing uh, States. It's uh, Ms. Heidi Schroeders Fox. And I would like to, to ask you a quick question to, to just try and close this session. Um, you know, we are seeing the low development countries have a number of challenges 
And of course, your, your office has a major role coordinating, following up what happens afterwards. And, and concern is about, of course, leapfrogging, leapfrogging, leapfrogging sorry, moving forward, and, and very importantly, coordinating a number of actors to interact. Um, how can, from your point of view, make sure that LDCs are not left behind? Um, thank you very much, Mr. Moderator and Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great pleasure to be here. And uh, our office, as was mentioned, uh, represents the 91 countries that are the most vulnerable, the least developed, landlocked, and small island developing states. And many of the representatives and the honorable ministers have already talked here and, and, and in particular, I think, uh, uh, put forward very relevant questions um, to these groups of countries. They face multiple challenges that make it very difficult for them to reach the SDGs and uh, build their economic growth. And unfortunately, the trends have not been very good recently. For example, in 2015, the average annual growth in gross domestic product was 3.8%, which is the lowest level of economic growth recorded in LDCs in two decades. And also, for the second year, LDC exports dropped uh, out of world trade, dropped under 1%. That's very low, under 1%. So um, if we are to make sure that uh, the least developed countries are really not left behind in the spirit of the SDGs, uh, we need urgently to reverse these declining trends. And uh, building productive capacity is, of course, a central priority for the least developed countries. And one of the key drivers of uh, productive capacity building is ICT. And this is a ICT, uh, as we have heard, is a key um, priority for all LDCs, small islands, and landlocked countries as well. My office has worked together with ITU, and we have come out with a um, report. It is not yet out, but should be in, in so out soon, saying uh, it's called Achieving Universal and Affordable Internet in the Least Developed Countries. And, uh, this highlights that, for example, there is relatively high mobile subscription penetration in LDCs, but internet access remains low in LDCs. It's estimated at 17.5% at the end of 2017 uh, who will be using internet. This is growth, uh, but still it's at such a rate that um, we are very unlikely to reach the uh, SDG target 9C, which uh, as for providing universal access to the internet by LDCs in 2020. But I'd like to finish with a, a piece of uh, good news and also directly to the question uh, of the Honorable Minister of Mali of, of what is being done in order to um, help, uh, in particular, these countries that are lagging uh, behind. Um, just a month ago, um, during the high-level week uh, uh, in New York uh, at the UN, the United Nations and um, the government of Turkey, after five years of negotiations by all UN member states, uh, signed a host country agreement for a new UN entity, which is the least developed uh, country's technology bank. And uh, so the bank will provide uh, science, technology, and uh, innovation-related services to all LDCs. Um, it will start beginning next year, and it really will help all the least developed countries to integrate them and their societies' economies into the knowledge-based uh, economy. It will be based in Gebze, Turkey, and the first years will concentrate on needs assessments, and also digital research access. And eventually, it will be working on all LDCs. And in the name of partnerships, I really would like to invite you all to partner with the new technology bank for the LDCs to help the most vulnerable countries uh, reach their science, technology, and innovation needs. Thank you. Very interesting, Ms. Schroders Fox. Thank you very much. We'll be looking forward to that publication, of course. Um, <clears throat> Right now, we have to break. We have to take a short break. 
Uh, this debate was amazing, excellent. Thank you very much for your contribution. We have a number of speakers. I promise, I promise we've taken good note. And in the next session, we will address you and you will be uh, joining, joining in. You will be jumping in with your com opinions and comments. Um, remember, uh, just one quick thing. You're all invited to attend uh, tonight's gala dinner at the Alvear Icon Hotel. It's, it's just walking distance from here. There will be security uh, stationed along the way so you can walk over there. They will guide you. It's, it's a, to a couple hundred meters. Um, if anyone has specific needs, there will be shuttles for you departing from the main entrance of this, this hotel, the Hilton, at 6.45. Um, at the end of the gala dinner tonight, there will be shuttles. Uh, to take at 10.30 p.m. local time, of course, to return to the official hotels. Uh, additionally, I'd like to let you know that if you have not already seen it, there's a booklet uh, in front of you. Uh, you can take a peek at it. It's our history. It's these 25 years uh, of the ITUD, and you're welcome to take a peek, look at it closely, uh, of course, and take it with you. Uh, with this, we break the session. We take a very short break at um, 40, uh, 15 to the hour. At 4.45, we reconvene. Uh, so enjoy your coffee and see you in very strictly 20 minutes. Thank you very much.